Are you stacking for a Japan style economic collapse? Hey everybody, thank you for watching Yankee Stacking. Really appreciate you watching my channel and this video. Are you stacking for a Japan style economic collapse? You know, it, China gets all the news right now. I mean, we're, we're, you know, thinking of them a lot. They're our biggest economic threat. Shoot, uh, Little Stack says, you know, China owns us, Dad. <laughs> and there's rightly, you know, and rightly so. We should be concerned uh, about China. But back in the 1980s, it was all about the Japanese. Japan had the reputation of being an economic juggernaut and I'll tell you, America was just, you know, wound up over them. I, take it from a guy who was there. I, I, was, I was stunned to see uh, Japan's growing influence back then. Uh, I remember in 1989 uh, when uh, Mitsubishi bought um, a 51% stake in Rockefeller Center. I mean, right there, right in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, we had an office in Manhattan. And I remember uh, the wave of uh, anxiety about you know, the Japanese, their, their uh, growing economic dominance. I mean, you could really feel it. I started my career uh, in the 80s as a uh, junior programmer at a large law firm, uh, headquarters in downtown Boston. And, you know, it, it, it didn't take many weeks after I started before my uh, uh, IT director gave me this book to read about Japan's manufacturing prowess, their uh, process improvement methodologies. I mean, they had this hot new team uh, organization structure that they had pioneered that everybody was talking about. And, and frankly, they were kicking our butts, especially in the automobile industry, but really across the board, they were dominant. And then uh, and, um, back on December 29th, 1989, the Japanese stock index, the Nikkei, it closed out at an insane high of 38,916 points. Now, for some perspective, that was 14 times the Dow. The Nikkei had started below 7,000 at the beginning of the 80s and had pushed above 10,000 by August of uh, 1984. And then they signed the Plaza Accord in 1985. And that just made everybody see Japan as this you know, emerging top financial player in the world. I mean, the, uh, you know, the yen was, was really strong compared to other currencies like the dollar. And uh, the Nikkei was just phew, outperforming the rest of the world. It was an amazing time. And there was this euphoric feeling that they could do nothing wrong. I was uh, a big into mutual funds back then before, you know, the popularity of ETFs really took off. And, well, I did play the Nikkei a bit. I mean, come on. <laughs> it was going way, way up. I was, you know, young. I had my whole life ahead of me. I didn't really care about price or earnings or bubbles. What are you talking about? Who cared? There was a guy named Peter Lynch uh, that I would follow. He was one of the uh, Wall Street gurus back in the 80s and 90s. He ran uh, Fidelity's Magellan Fund, which was the largest mutual fund in the world at one point. And and he wrote, the Japanese have their own way of thinking about stocks. And I don't understand it yet. <laughs> Every day I go over there to study the situation, I conclude that all the stocks are grossly overpriced, but they keep going higher anyway. Oh, man, I don't think Peter was used to central bank shenanigans back then. <laughs> but you know, does, does, does that not sound familiar? I mean, you know, the, the, the crazy PEs, the, 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 the total disconnect between markets and the real economy. Look, look at this chart of the Nikkei adjusted for inflation right there at the top you know, divided by CPI. And it tells an ominous story. Barely seven months after that incredible peak, it all changed. I mean, th this is what is called Japan's lost decade. It was a rebound from 2003 to 2007. A lot of people were kind of hopeful back then. Okay, maybe this will change it around, but mm -mm, nope. <laughs> Not with a global financial crisis, 2008. You know, the Nikkei was just right back down to four-digit territory. And, and then in March 
2009, it hit its lowest point since October in 1982. This rise and fall of Japan's markets almost perfectly demonstrates the, the building and the bursting of an asset bubble. And it also shows, rather starkly, I think, that when a, a, a bubble economy pops, it doesn't always rebound. It can be an incredibly long and painful process. Now, at the end of the video, I'm going to you know, try to tie this all together with what we're facing now, especially in the United States. But you know, stick with me here. There, there's a lot to learn. If this is really important. I, mean, I think Teddy Roosevelt once said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. So what happened with Japan? First of all, the collapse came in waves. Early on, there was this uh, you know, widespread belief that you know, Japan was merely going through a mild recession. Yeah, that's it. It was just going to you know, stop soon and be the dawn of a whole new boom. Yeah, it was just temporary. Property values in Japan actually continued going up for the first months after the Nikkei started to go down. But you know, eventually, the real estate just started to tank as well. And what did Japan do? Their, well, what did the central banks, I should say, do? They cut interest rates a lot, <laughs> but that didn't help, all right? It just kept going down. And then there was the growing banking crisis. Failing loans started piling up. Bank stocks started tanking. And, you know, and here's the tip, guys. When you see the financial stocks in a market tumble, that usually is the sign that the nails in the coffin for that equities market. I'm going to tell you, prior to Japan's lost decade, if you had told me this was going to happen, I wouldn't have believed it. It was, it was just unimaginable that this would happen. Th this was Japan, but it did. Japan's economic debacle was persistent and deep. Re remember those two words, persistent and deep. I'm going to come back to those later on. And what happened was this lost decade uh, for Japan just, just stretched out into a pair of lost decades. I mean, shoot, the Nikkei still hasn't gotten anywhere near its highs when adjust it for inflation. Could you have made money during this time? Of course you could have. The market casino was still open. It was just that the building was on fire, right? <laughs> what this meant was a bunch of pain and suffering for an entire generation. I mean, think about it. Can you imagine trying to retire during this time? And this was even with the fact that the Japanese were once some of the world's biggest savers. I mean, their household debt to GDP in the 80s and 90s was incredibly low. But even with all that, it, it was an unmitigated disaster. So what can we learn? Or better yet, I should probably say it. What should we learn from this? You know, it's funny, but some people say that, that, that the uh, <laughs> Japan's central bank leaders are just a bunch of mental midgets compared to the brain trust we have now with the U.S. Federal Reserve. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and they didn't go far enough. Yeah, I, I've heard that one too. The, the, you know, people saying, you know, if they had only really gone all in, you know, uh, they, they could have solved this problem. Those are the same ones who think... You know, Franklin Roosevelt didn't go far enough in the 1930s by not, you know, expanding the New Deal or something. Yeah, they say that the Japanese policymakers were, were just too concerned about deficit spending. They should have supersized their spending, right? <laughs> the complaint was they didn't cut interest rates fast enough. They didn't, you know, bail out the zombie banks fast enough. They, they, they took too long to, you know, put fiscal stimulus in place. Shoot, they needed, you know, massive public works right away and they didn't do it right away. Well, I, obviously I disagree with all that. And I'm not alone either. If you go back to um, uh, 2009, when the uh, Federal Reserve and, you know, President Bush did what they thought was the right thing, hundreds of economists signed an ad in the New York Times uh, that said, quote, more government spending did not solve Japan's lost decade. It is a triumph of hope over experience to believe that more government spending will help the U.S. today. 
And also back then, um, the Reason Foundation wrote an article uh, entitled Lessons from Japan's Bubble and Recession. And they said that Japan's central bank's loose monetary policy and massive public work spending, which they did get around to doing, quote, only prevented Japan from rolling out of its own asset bubble downturn and made the crisis worse. In other words, if they had done it right, it could have been called the last few years, okay? The Reason Foundation finished the report by saying similar policies by the U.S. would turn us into, quote, a zombie business economy. And that's really what we have today in America. Now, I can hear a bunch of you out there probably saying, oh, come on, Yankee. Are you serious? They wrote that crap back in 2009. You know, all that stuff that they were worried about, you know, ZERP, uh, stimulus checks, QE infinity, bailouts, it all worked. And when Trump gets his new uh, trillion dollar public work stimulus through, it's all good, baby. <laughs> and Japan, really? Yankee, come on. Dude, that's so last century. Come on, you are so freaking old. This is America. We're in the 21st century now. We rule. <laughs> yeah, it's a phenomenal nation. It, it's a nation of uh, uh, virtuous liberty and, and, and unrivaled historic economic strength. But I contend we have squandered our position of strength by abandoning free market principles, sound money, and fiscal responsibility. We have also abandoned the idea that the Federal Reserve is supposed to be independent. They're called to make the hard decisions, not the popular ones. You know, when, when Jerome Powell was on, uh, he's the Fed chairman, right? So he, he went to Capitol Hill for a couple days. And, and when he was seated before Congress, every single congressman and congresswoman began their questioning with, with incredible praise. Oh, the, what you've done was so wonderful. You know, that was the right thing to do. Uh, and here's my question. I, that is a bad sign, folks. That is a sign that the Fed is not, not doing the right thing. That it's been doing uh, uh, politically expedient things and kowtowing to the markets and politicians. We don't want that. We don't want uh, the Fed to be helpful or popular or, or anything of the sort, but but we want them to do the right thing. And, you know, I think the problem really stems from the fact that most people actually believe that the role and purpose of the Federal Reserve is to prop up the economy, to, you know, make sure that uh, everybody gets their job back, the, the same job back, that, that no one feels any pain, Right. I mean, it's not their fault, right? No, it is not the government nor the Fed's job to guarantee your employment. I, that may sound a little harsh, but it's true. The federal government doesn't owe you a living because the government can't owe you a living. It, it, it can't do that. It doesn't have anything that it first doesn't take from someone else and then just redistribute it. The Fed also doesn't have access to some, you know, money stash somewhere and you know that the government can't get to it can only redistribute currency too by you know affecting purchasing power through inflation that's what the fed can do they can raise inflation or lower it that's their that, that's the power they have but to think there is no impact whatsoever with the fed's printing press going berserk led to, you know, Wall Street and Congress just lavishing praise on the Fed. The last time we had a grilling of a Fed chairman was back when Ben Bernanke was on the hot seat. And there was a lot of doubt and concern by Congress over, you know, what he was doing. The money printing, the negative rates. They were scared at that time, but not now. Oh, no. <laughs> the skepticism is long gone. They don't care that the Fed is buying bonds. They don't care they're buying jump bonds. Shoot, they won't care if they start buying stock. That's, that's just wonderfully necessary now. All right. <laughs> Rant over. <laughs> but seriously, the praise is, is all over the place. And, and I think, I really do think that that is proof that the Federal Reserve is blowing it. 
All right. So anyways, I'll, I think I'm going to talk about this more in an upcoming video because I still think there are those watching this channel right here, this video that actually believe that, you know, printing currency can, you know, create jobs and, and, and build prosperity. If you think that's the case, well, wow, maybe you think that what the Fed's doing is good, but you're wrong. So anyways, let me go back to where I think we're at and what we need to learn from Japan. We suffer from short-term thinking, just the now thinking, right now. All that matters is right now. I mean, that's, that's Trump, uh, that's Congress, that's the Fed, that's institutional investors, that, that's, that's retail investors. Shoot, that's, that's teenage dip-buying Robin Hood traders and their merry men. You know, that's everybody. They're, everyone has this short-term memory. No, no, one, no one seems to care one bit about the systemic risks to what we're doing. And they just, you know, chalk up what I'm saying is just fear-mongering. But in my opinion, I don't think we're going to get out of this decade unscathed. We have our own reckoning, our own lost decades coming. And I think it's going to be actually far worse than Japan. We have far more debt than Japan did. We are not savers. We are not prepared for what's coming. And I think it's going to be even more persistent and deeper. Remember, persistent and deep. I think it's going to be worse. So I ask you, are you even slightly defensive with your portfolio, your, your stocks and bonds? Or, or are you just simply enjoying the free drinks in the comp room at the stock market casino? Really? Are you ready for negative interest rates? NERP. I mean, we have them in, in, in real terms now, but but are you protecting yourself from nominal negative interest rates with your precious metals? NERP. I mean, Japan did it. They've gone negative. And I believe we're going to too. Are you stacking to prepare for our deflationary period that we're in right now to give way to stagflation and then possibly hyperinflation? And finally, are you prepared to go through more than... 20 years of market loss adjusted for inflation? I mean, I, I can't imagine. I, I wonder what it would have been like to ask uh, the Japanese that question back in the 80s. This could be an incredible opportunity, P potentially a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to protect yourself, to, to increase your wealth before something worse than a Japan style economic collapse comes well i hope you enjoyed this video thank you so much for watching and i hope your day is a-okay <laughs>